Personally, I consider it a privilege to be introducing a person whom I consider to be one of the finest academics in our part of the world. I have been his admirer, I have been reading him and today it's my privilege to welcome on the dais Professor Fakhrul Alam, UGC Professor, Department of English, University of Dhaka. Shabaike Suddha, Shabaike Shubhetsha, Anakta Chandra Bhattanur Mata Habe Ami Ingreji Te Porbo, Ebong Academic Eta Paper Porbo, Shuru Thikhe Shesh, Pore, Shabaike, Shabaike Shabaike Excuse Ne Ni Thi. Uh, the 1947 partition from a thrice partitioned national perspective. Let me begin my presentation anecdotally. It was last April that I was invited by New Delhi's South Asian University to be in a plenary conversation with Professor Abhi Subedi of Tribhuvan University on the subject of the partitioning of the subcontinent. En route to Delhi, I spent almost a day with Professor Shubhendra Dashgupta কালকে রাতে ওনার সাথে ছিলাম আজকে সকালবেলাও ছিলাম একটা না 9 ঘন্টা কথা বলেছি হু হ্যাড টট এট ক্যালকাটা ইউনিভার্সিটি সাউথ এশিয়ান স্টাডিজ সেন্টার ফর আ লং টাইম আই টোল্ড শুভেন্দু দা দ্যাট রিফ্লেক্টিং অন পার্টিশন मेक्स মি অলওয়েজ রিফ্লেক্ট অন হোয়াট এন অল্টারড থিং সো মেনি অফ आवर লাইভস হ্যাড বিকাম বিকজ অফ পার্টিশন ইফ 1947 হ্যাড নট টেকেন প্লেস আই সেড টু হিম আই উড হ্যাভ my mother to the city where he used to work in the building and maintenance department of the Indian Railway. There they stayed until 1946 and there my elder sister was raised immediately after death, uh, uh, after she was born. I told Shuvinduda that my father, who had an abiding love for Hindustani classical music as well as Rovindu Shungit, and my mother, who had picked up basic Urdu quite easily like him, seemed to have settled in nicely until the partitioning of India made them come away. Shubhendu responded by pointing out how if there was no partition, his parents would have remained in Chittagong, where they had been living comfortably even though the Dasguptas apparently originated in Borishal and Bikrampur. He also said something that reminded me of a very eloquent piece he wrote on the death of his father. Refugees who had just arrived in the city and knew almost no one there, the wife and his children had immense problems cremating him in Calcutta. Eventually they did so, but Shubhendu's mother made him and his brothers vow that they would always volunteer to cremate dead people who had almost none to do the last rituals for them. My paper this day is on the impact of the 1947 partition on Bangladeshi slash Bengali lives, Bangladeshi institutions and our culture. I will be also giving examples of the human cost of their slicing of the Indian subcontinent as reflected in the writings of my country's founding father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, or as we call him, Bangabundhu, and on our literature and films based on creative people whose work I know and admire. I will also look at the way the portioning of India affected the University of Dhaka, with which I have an association that has now crossed 50 years. The political ideology of Bangabundhu has reflected in his posthumously published unfinished memoirs and the way it evolved in its first phase because of partition related issues will form the next part of my presentation. I will then look briefly at the work of Jivano Dash, uh, who as we all know is often dubbed the poet of Rupushi Bangla or beautiful Bengal and whose life and psyche seem to have been fractured by the partition he did not want to accept but had to live with. The novelist Amitav Ghosh who is to me the classic modern South Asian novel in English of the partitioning of Bengal and Tanvir Makama's film trilogy on the breaking up of our part of the world and its consequences for people caught up in history that change their lives and relationships forever will then be the focus of my presentation. Let me add as I end this introductory part of my paper that I am looking at the 1947 partition from a purely Bangladeshi perspective. And that perspective has been formed by the fact that Bangladeshis had been witness to three partitions. Firstly, there was Bongo Bongo or the short-lived partition of Bengal in 1905. Uh, secondly, there was the partition of 1947, which will be my center of attention for the most part of the paper. But for all Bangladeshis of our generation, the most overwhelming partition was 1971. This was not a partition in the literal sense. 
if you think of it as only splitting contiguous territories, but another complete breakup of a political unit, as well as an irrevocable parting of ways for people who had at one point been, so to speak, stapled together by shared religious affinities despite obvious differences and despite geography. I'm of course talking about the split of Pakistan, which all, we all know once consisted of East and West Pakistan, but is now only what was West Pakistan, and how people in the East decided to break away from it at one point to create the state of Bangladesh. I would now like to discuss the three partitions in a little more detail so that we can get some sense of their impact on our national identity formation. Bongo Bongo, or the first partition in 1905, clearly has had the originary role in this context. This partition had any number of causes. The British Viceroy Lord Curzon claimed that it was administrative in intention. To most anti-colonial Hindu Bengalis and a few Muslim ones, my, my Nana was in the Congress and he was Shadeshi, I would like to add. To some in leading Hindu Muslim Bengali leaders of the eastern part, however, it was necessary and desirable, since they felt that though numerically superior to their part of the Bengal, to this their part of the world, they were being continuously slighted by Kolkata-based Hindu upper-class power apparatus that was gathering strength all the time at the expense of the British. Of course, the first partition of Bengal was short-lived because of the intense campaign against it led by Kolkata-based Hindu or Brahmo Bengalis. But though it was revoked in 1911, it created the seeds of permanent division between Hindus and Muslims of Bengal. In particular, the Muslims of East Bengal were made to think more and more because of it of an alternative mode of existence, where they would not have to play second fiddle and could have a decisive say in the affairs of the part of Bengal where they constituted a majority. It is surely no coincidence then that the All India Muslim League was born in 1906 and that many in the eastern parts of Bengal would eventually gravitate in the next few decades towards a party that would ultimately lead them to the second partition of Bengal in 1947. The first partition might have been annulled in six years' time, but the split that remained in Bengali Muslim psyches afterwards would widen in the next 40 or so years until it led to the birth of Pakistan. But as we all know, the 1947 of, uh, partition of India proved to be even more short-lived than the first one. The Muslim Bengalis who now constituted an overwhelming majority in what had now become East Pakistan had the numbers swelling because so many Hindu East Bengalis had left for India on the one hand while on the other, so many West Bengali Muslims had opted to move eastward as well. But Muslim Bengalis had caused for disillusionment almost as soon as Pakistan became a reality. The first reason for this was the Pakistan intention to make Urdu the only state language of Pakistan, despite protests that broke out as soon as the intention was broadcast by West Pakistani leaders and their East Pakistani lackeys. The second reason that disillusionment set in was political, for the East Pakistanis began to realize that though they constituted a majority in Pakistan, they would never have a decisive say in running the country, a fate they seemed destined to live with yet again. But thirdly, they began to realize year by year of the economic exploitation they were being subjected to in a country that was supposed to be theirs. Their resources were clearly being utilized by West Pakistanis while they themselves were being deprived of the greater part of the revenue earnings amassed in their part of the world because of their produce. Consequently, the catchword for East Pakistan leaders from the 1960s became autonomy. They felt that if their wing of Pakistan was to remain part of the country, they would have to be empowered in a way they weren't till then. They would like, now like to be at the helm of the political and economic administration of the country fully. The election of 1970 confirmed that such thinking had almost total support in East Pakistan. But by March 1971, its people realized that Pakistanis were not going to cede power to them fairly or reasonably. And so East Pakistan experienced a third parting of ways when they broke away. The West Pakistan attempt to pummel them into submission having failed miserably. And so Bangladesh was born. In other words, East Pakistanis were heirs to a process of identity, uh, uh, Bangladesh is sorry, were heirs to a process of identity formation based on these three partitions. I do feel that people from our part of the Bengal now look at 1947 from a mindscape where the first layer is Bongo Bongo, the second the split from India and the birth of Pakistan, and the third the breakup of Pakistan and the birth of Bangladesh. In other words, the most important parting of ways politically for a Bengali Muslim is 1971. For now we look at our history from a completely Bangladeshi and not a purely Bengali vantage point. 
Let us now see how this perspective has impacted on people from our part of the world before, during and after the partition of 1947. As portrayed in one of the key educational institutions, the University of Dhaka, the life of their founding father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and the work of Jiwanand Dash, I'm going to skip him, uh, a, 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 and the works of Tanvir Mukammal, a Bangladeshi filmmaker whose parents had to settle in Bangladesh and leave Kolkata for the same reason. The University of Dhaka, where I've been teaching for over four decades now, is central to the issue of national identity formation of Bangladesh. As such, its history is closely linked to the three partitions. It is undoubtedly the outcome of the events that led to first Bongo Bongo and then the annulment of the first partition of Bengal. It had obviously raised Muslim Bengali hopes for autonomous existence. By the turn of the century, many Bengali Muslim leaders had come to realize that they needed not only madrasa or primary and secondary schools in the country, but also higher studies. These leaders soon demanded a university of their own. Sensing their dismay at the withdrawal of the partition of Bengal of 1905, the British decided to assess the prospects of a university for this region that would make up for their backtracking on Bongo Bongo. That is why, by 1912, the British decided to form the Nathan Commission to come up with recommendations on this issue. Some people in Kolkata opposed the move, but the Commission came up with a positive recommendation. It was thus that in 1921, the University of Dhaka was born. In delivering the first convocation speech of the University in 1922, the Viceroy, Lord Lytton declared that the university was a, quote, way of making up to the Muslims of East Bengal for the partition of Bengal and splendid imperial compensation for the loss of Bengal, unquote. Though Lord Lytton hoped that the university would be a secular institution, even while oriented to the Muslims of East Bengal, and the Hindus constituted the majority among the teachers as well as the students till 1947, the stress on Islamic studies, Islamic history, Arabic, Persian and Urdu, and the graduation of a large number of Muslim students from East Bengal at a time when the Muslim League was increasingly visible here as in other parts of British India, meant that many of these graduates would be subscribing to the two nations theory. They would be joining the movement of Pakistan for Pakistan, and in some cases even taking the lead in the bid to carve Pakistan out of the eastern districts of the subcontinent, where they constituted a majority. In other words, the partition of 1947 that resulted in the splitting of Bengal was directly or indirectly affected not only by the partition of 1905, but the consequent compensatory birth of the University of Dhaka, inclining not a few of them to make their land part of Pakistan. But the secular strain in the university's graduate also meant that when soon after Pakistan was created, it was a few other prominent students of the institution of the partition period who took the lead in not merely opposing the arbitrary imposition of Urdu all over Pakistan, but in emphasizing the secular aspects of the education as a counter to the excessive Islamization of the Eastern wing of the country at the expense of shared Bengali values. The result was at first the outburst after February 21st, 1952, that led to the language movement, the demand for making Bengali a core state language, and that the movement for a secular, autonomous, and truly independent state. The emphasis on affirming the Bengali heritage associated with the culture of the land played an important part in this movement. With hindsight, we can say that the partition of Bengal in 1947 that took place only on the basis of religion was not seen to be sufficient for the people of East Bengal anymore. The demand for linguistic and cultural autonomy was now seen as a desired goal. Subsequently, the need to remove economic disparity was added to this list. In all these movements, the University of Dhaka played a leading part. When the Pakistani government decided to use brute force to stem this tidal movement towards almost total autonomy and cancel the parliamentary election results of 1970 that gave the Army League a clear majority, the liberation movement started. The university was at the heart of the movement and the site of the most vigorous protests and thus the most direct target for the Pakistanis when they decided to crack the movement. But the Pakistanis were defeated by the liberation forces consisting of the Indian Army and Bangladeshi freedom fighters and independent Bangladesh was born. In the process, not a few Dhaka University teachers and graduates lost their lives. In a new country that was born after a protracted struggle and a bloody war, Bangladeshis veered away from the exclusively Islamic identity that was being forced upon them. 
as before the University of Dhaka campus led the way in becoming secular space where Bengali would flavor all activities. However, because of the earlier partitions, partitions with Bengal, Bongo Bongo, the breakup of India and the breakup of Pakistan, Bangladeshis would view the partition of 1947 from a reconstituted space where an Islamic as well as secular strain had layered. As a result, the division of 1947 would, would be only a part of their mindscape. That is to say, the University of Dhaka as a lead institution will be championing Bangladeshi culture after 1971 as something distinct from either the culture which had leaned completely towards the secular strain or exclusively towards the Islamic one, as was the case in the earlier periods of the history. Although for sure, the secular side that the teachers and the students of the university would be, it was a secular side that the teachers and the students of the university would be inclined to in overwhelming fashion. I would now like to focus on the intellectual and political evolution of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. From the time he became an activist of the Muslim League to a young leader of the Muslim Arm League to the man who spearheaded the East Pakistani Arm League's movement, first towards real autonomy and then led almost all the people of East Pakistan who were Bengalis towards total independence. As before, I will be viewing this evolution in a trajectory where the partition of 1947 played a pivotal part. My source here will be two of his manuscripts written in jail, The Prison Diaries, which was published in 2012, but was written probably in 66-67 in Bengali, and New China, which was probably written in 1954. Uh, the Bengali version has come out, uh, they killed him uh, in February, uh, and the English version is due any time now. Both more or less unfinished, but both now made available in print in their original Bengali, and even in Bengali translation, translations. I will use the English translations here which I have been responsible for. However, my primary stress will be on what has been titled in Bengali as Oshmapta Atojibani and in the English translation as the Unfinished Memoirs. In this book, we see that the initial move that turned the young Mujib in 1937 towards the political direction leading to Bangladesh was when he became the General Secretary of the Muslim Welfare Association in Gopal Ganj then in Forikpur district. A year later, he came into contact with A.K.M. Fuzlhok as well as Hussein Shahid Sarwardi. He was obviously excited at the prospect of meeting the two leading leaders of the Bengali Muslim community to quote him. He formed at this time, to quote him again, a volunteer brigade with the help of the Muslim boys to receive them. This was a time when the Hindus and the Muslims of the area had become wary of each other. Noticeably, the young boy is sensing a division where he, where he might have to opt for the side taken by these two leaders. Soon Mujib gets into a mission to rescue a classman called Malik who had been abducted by a local Hindu Mahashavar leader. This leads to a tussle between Hindu and Muslim boys and he is subsequently taken to a police station. In fact, at one point he has to spend a week in a sub-jail for this reason. Ultimately, the Hindu and Muslim leaders agree to not resort to litigation anymore and settle the matter amicably. As a result, he is released from prison. Having had the first of many jail, jail experiences would be recording in the unfinished memoirs and other works he had written in prison. But the incident only makes Mujib even more determined at that stage of his life to involve himself in Muslim League politics out of the conviction that, quote, we would have to create Pakistan for without it Muslims had no future in our part of the world, unquote. When Mujib went for further studies to Kolkata from Gopal Ganj, he continued to be active in Muslim League politics and the movement that would be gaining momentum throughout East Bengal and would be leading Bengali Muslims of the region straight towards Pakistan. Here he came under the tutelage of Hussein Shahid Sarwardi and freed himself from the influence of A.K.M. Fuzlok, who had opted to form a coalition with Shyam Prashad Mukherjee. Like many other Muslims of East Bengal, Mujib began to be increasingly convinced that partition was the only desirable end for them and that Sarwardi was leading them in the right direction and not Fuzlok. As an active supporter, he even began to give speeches in meetings where he concentrated on explaining to everyone why it was important for Bengali Muslims to quote him again to fight for Pakistan. The unfinished memoirs indicates clearly that the young Mujib in his Faridpur and Kolkata phase believed, like his father and innumerable other quite educated and reasonably well of Bengali Muslims did, that partition was a desideratum, desideratum for all Bengali Muslims. Mujib and others like him felt that quote of the Hindu leaders only Deshbandhu, Chitranjan, Dash and Netaji Shubhas Bosch in the politics as well as Rabindranath Tagore through his writings 
unquote, understood the way East Bengali Muslims had been made to suffer because of, quote, Hindu landlords and money lenders, unquote. However, he is only too aware that Muslim landlords were often culpable in this regard, albeit only for financial reasons. And thus it was that under Sarwadi's leadership, we find him active in the pre-partition years, not only in Kolkata, but also in campaigns throughout East Bengal, and even in the pre-referendum weeks in Silet. But before the partition of India could be over, Muji witnessed the horrors of partition in the streets of Kolkata firsthand. In the Kolkata pre-partition riots, he was appalled by bloody confrontations taking place where Hindu and Muslims were battling in the streets and armed gangs of both sides were attacking vulnerable people with little weapons. He himself took up arms to patrol a Muslim neighborhood for a while. And soon after these horrifying riots, there were riots in Noakhali where Muslims had, to quote him, started to looting, started, had started looting Hindu homes and torching them. And then in Bihar, where Bihari Muslims were being destroyed, he had volunteered to be part of a relief mission. By the time he came back to Kolkata, he was literally sick as well as sickened by what he had experienced in the last few months. When he got well, he felt some healing when his guru, Mr. Sarwardi, began working with Gandhi. Mujib experiences first hand Mahatma Gandhi's security power at the time. At a meeting, for example, he saw someone read out what Gandhi had written, and I'm quoting from uh, Bangabandhu's quote, Muslims and Hindus are brothers. Simply, simple words he records in his manuscript that changed the tense atmosphere of the meeting immediately for good. But the process of partitioning India continued. After it was all over, Mujib began studies at the NU, NU at the University of Dhaka, where he continued to be active in his Pakistani politics as a student leader. He found out at every juncture now that the lot of East Bengal Muslims were not going to, was not going to change drastically in a country that had, at least on paper, become independent. More than the Muslim landlords of East Bengal who had continued to be exploitative and indifferent to the plight of peasants and lower class people everywhere in what was now the eastern wing of Pakistan, the rulers of the western wing led by Jinnah would be pursuing politics that would alienate Mujib and many people of his generation from the concept of Pakistan. He also found himself as a remove from the feudal men running the Muslim League in East Pakistan. It was evident at every step to the young Mujib, almost as soon as the British left, that partition was not going to lead to the kind of independence for the people of East Pakistan that had made him so vocal for the cause of Pakistan as a Muslim leader from East Bengal for almost a decade by then. He now banded together with some other like-minded young men to form the East Pakistan Muslim Students League. The response it evoked among the young was immediate and very positive. So much so that when the news came that the Pakistan Constituent Assembly had met in Karachi and was discussing the possibility of making Urdu the only state language of Pakistan, the response from these Bengali youths was overwhelmingly negative. His activism, this time for the cause of Bengali, once again landed him in jail, but now in what was supposed to be a free country. Out of it soon, he resumed his campaign for his mother tongue with an ever-growing band of students. As the young Muji put his, puts it in his unfinished memoirs, every race loves his mother tongue. No nation has tolerated any attempt to insult, insult its mother tongue. It was everywhere apparent in the province that whatever reversal had occurred in the secular side of Bengali Muslims of the region because of the partition of 1947 was now going through another cycle of reversal. It would soon become apparent as well that Muji would be taking the lead part in the breakup of Pakistan that would occur in the third partition of the region in 1971. First the language movement, then the six point movement of the 60s and subsequently the events leading up to March 26, 1971 and finally, in the succeeding 10 months, history would be reversed yet again, so that the consequences of 1947 would be to a large extent undone. Bangladesh would be born in 16 December 1971 as a secular country, although in one holding on to its Muslim identity, since the vast number of its people were devout Muslims. But what is also interesting is how in the Pakistan he had fought for politically, the divisions between Hindus and Muslims seems to have disappeared for him. Mujib reports approvingly in the unfinished memoirs that when the Pakistan Constituent Assembly met in Karachi in February 1948 and discussed the issue of making Urdu the national language and most Muslim members from the Eastern Wing was inclined to support this move, it was Babu Dhirendranath Dotto, a member of the Congress Party of Kumila at the time, who, 
quote, demanded that Bengali should be chosen, chosen since the majority of the Bengali pe population spoke the language, unquote. It is obvious at this point that Mujib supported this stance and was thus not willing to lean solely on the ideology that created Pakistan anymore. When he was beginning to believe that what was increasingly at stake was the survival of Bengali identity, in, uh, sorry, he was beginning to believe that what was increasingly at stake <clears throat> was the survival of Bengali identity in Pakistan because of the threat to the Bengali language. <laughs> Mujib describes in his unfinished memoirs how in 1950 he had shared a go in Gopal Ganj jail um, a room with two other political prisoners, Gopal Ganj's Babu Chandra Ghosh of the forward bloc party and Madharipur's Foni Mujumdar, who was already active in the Army Muslim League. The Pakistani government apparently had put them together in one cell since it believed they were all basically leftists as far as their ideological stripe was concerned. But what is particularly relevant for us here is Mujib's admiration for Ghosh, a leader who seemed to have imbibed Mahatma Gandhi's ideology of non-violence and heroic passive resistance. Muji points out how before being imprisoned, he had tried to convince government officials not to punish men like Ghosh, for not only society as a whole would benefit from such a selfless person, but also because these people could be utilized to build the country now that it had become independent. Muji goes on to stress how he was no longer going to pay heed to any talk that tried to create a split between Bengali Muslims and the Bengali Hindus who had stayed back, terming such talk unequivocally as nonsensical. Undoubtedly, Mujib had imbibed Gandhi's ideology of nonviolence as well as passive resistance in this phase of his career fully. Undoubtedly, too, he was embracing secular values in this phase and was moving away from the kind of partition politics of an earlier phase, whereas a Bengali Muslim, he was wary of Hindu dominating people. The Bangladesh Mujib now envisioned would be a secular space and one that had overcome the divisiveness between the Bengali Hindus and Muslims created by partition. The last point I want to make in this part of my paper, where I'm dealing with Mujib's evolution as a leader of Bengali Muslims, who had begun his career in a community where Hindi-Muslim tensions were, were palpable, and who had worked for the partition of India zealously, <clears throat> but who in an independent Pakistan was no longer holding on to any view that would divide Bengali Muslims and Hindus anymore, is that his attitude to Indian Bengalis in particular and Indian Muslims in general underwent a sea change in independent Pakistan. I will have to give, I will have to be content here by giving only one example of this from, the, from his unfinished prison works. This is in the section of the unfinished memoirs where he is describing his 10 day visit to New China in 1952 as a member of the Pakistan peace delegation. In the 11 page account of this trip in the published work, and now I think we have a 90 page book on this in Bangla. We have a number of references that suggest that Mujib's characteristic warmth is everywhere on display whenever he talks about any or all members of the Indian delegation, whether Bengali, Hindu or Muslim, or whatever else their religious beliefs were. In the unfinished memoirs and now and the longer and earlier work published in Bengali earlier this month as Ahmad Dakar Noachin, Mujib is obviously delighted that the Indian Pakistan delegates were mixing freely and enthusiastically. He makes particular mention of the warmth of his encounter with the novelist Manoj Boshu. Uh, he also gave a speech in Bengali in 1952 in Peking, uh, be, uh, very deliberately. That the border should no longer keep people apart because of differences stemming from religion was Mujib's belief from now on. He put the matter, in fact, from a perspective that is truly international. It is a quote from the unfinished met memoirs, testifying to what I would like to end this, uh, to that I would like to end this part of my po presentation on Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the partition of Bengal. What he suggests at one point of the visit to China is people from newly liberated countries like India and Pakistan had an obligation to come together. To quote him, it was vital to build public opinion in favor of world peace. And everyone, everywhere, irrespective of religion or nationality, should do their part to achieve this goal. Surely it is a goal that we must all adhere to at this time of the subcontinent's history. The next section which I'm going to skip is on my favorite poet, Jiran Dash. And I think the poem which is absolutely key, central, is Unisho Chechulish Satchulish. Uh, and it's a poem we must all, I think, read on this occasion very carefully. And I wanted to read it as a Bangladeshi, but I'm going to skip through this occasion, through, uh, through this on this occasion. But uh, not only that poem, uh, you know, all of Jiran poems, especially the poems of the late 40s, 
uh, early 50s. If you look at them and the unpublished ones, some of them are some of them are unpublished ones. I think I have very different concrete references that are very relevant. I will instead uh, go, go to Tanvir Mukammal's films. Uh, Tanvir Mukammal's films. Uh, Tanvir is about three years my junior. He was my direct student in Dhaka University. He's an independent filmmaker, uh, dedicating his life to filmmaking, and Mukammal's film are mostly dedicated to representing traumas associated with these decisive, divisive, decisive movements in Bangladesh's history and the diasporas and marginalizations of minorities that have ensued for them with sympathy as well as insight and alluding to classics not only of Bangladesh literature but also in a few cases to masterpieces of the Western tradition. It traces the impact on individual lives of such events in the region. With sympathy as well insight and alluding to classics not only of Bangladesh literature but also in a few cases to masterpieces of the Western tradition, it traces the impact on individual lives of such events in the region. Events that have unsettled seemingly moribund ways of existence, and in many cases have cramped lives. His concern mainly, let me emphasize too, on the plight of what we, call, we could all call minorities, people doubly colonized or cornered, and is interested in depicting the tribes. It is, if it is as if he is bent on emphasizing how in Bangladesh, we in Bangladesh, I'm talk, I would like to emphasize, tend to occlude such agonizing memories and shut out thoughts that would prove to be too much of a burden on our collective conscience as we move forward in nation making. Tanvir was born in Khulna, uh, he, uh, but, uh, but his parents lived in Calcutta and they moved away after partition. I would like to point out today, it was earlier, uh, earlier there was a mention about Silet, but Khulna was also uh, the uh, victim of Lord Mount, uh, Radcliffe's arbitrary scissor cutting. In that year, Mukammal's father, then a magistrate in West Bengal, opted for Pakistan. I skip to this and go to the film. In Chitra Nodir Pare, Mukammal is bent on reminding his viewers that cost in human misery of partition and the wrong done to Hindi Bengalis of the region in the province. He underscores to the Islamization that had been spurred there because of aggressive policies adopted by successive Muslim League and slash or military governments, depicting, depicting, depicting them as calculated to uproot Hindus so that land grabbers and the Muslim bourgeoisie could have a field day in East Pakistan. <clears throat> but it appears to be the case as well that Mokamal is reminding his contemporary Bangladeshi audience in 1999, who had democracy restored to them a few years back in 1991, of the dangers to not only liberal values, but also to minorities that had been posed by military governments that took over Bangladesh after the assassination of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. By focusing on such issues in his film, Mukammal is clearly alerting his viewers so that they can learn from the past to avoid further tragedies such as the one associated with the riots of the partitioning of the subcontinent or the Hazrat Bal Mosque incident in 1964. His quite lyrical film about a beautiful river town Threatened riverbank town threatened and changed forever by partition induced divisions does appear to de design not only to direct attention to his Bangladeshi audience to the wrongs that had been done to the minority population and were occluded in the collective memories of Bangladeshis but also to alert them so that they could learn from past mistakes. Uh, we haven't talked about this today. Today we have such wonderful speeches uh, throughout but his second uh, film that I wanted to talk about which I Consider trilogies Shopno Bhumi, and it's entirely about Biharis in Bangladesh and how we have forgotten them, how we are, they are cornered, and how we have forgotten them. Um, uh, it is Mukammal's mission in Shopno Bhumi to turn the spotlight on the people who have been left stranded, because these are also partitions victims in the both Bengals. I think this is important to remember. It is the narratives of the shattered lives that he presented presents in this documentary made 40 years after partition in 2007. He seems bent on interrogating the collective memories of Bangladeshis about the Bihari refugees in the midst, who seem to have reached a dead end in their lives, having been abandoned by the Pakistani state they had believed in after it had been truncated permanently in the Bangladeshi War of Independence. Not surprisingly, they are treated with suspicion, resentment or indifference by most people of the country they feel stuck in. In other words, in Shopno Bhumi, Mokamal once again continues to narrate the painful history of partitions after effects by focusing on another of the festering collective wounds it had created. The more than 160,000 men and women quartered in camps are to Mukammal, another instance of the devastation 
the partitioning of the subcontinent left in its wakes for so many people in the two countries created by it. And for this group, with the subsequent breakup of Pakistan. Shivanta Rekha takes the Tanvi back to the subject of Hindu Bengalis forced directly or indirectly to leave the land of the birth that he had treated in Chitra Nodi Pare. However, it is a documentary, and, at, and, at its, and its time and geographical frame is much more extended. It includes the pre 1947 partition riot refugees, the refugees who left East Pakistan later because of fundamentalist provocators, to the ones who were part of the mass migration resulting from the genocide of 1971, and then the refugees leaving India afterwards because of economic or political reasons or other motives. Mokamala is thus bent in Shimanta Rekha and presenting to his Bangladeshi audience what they've been occluding for generation, generations, the trauma of Hindu migrants forced out by religious ideological considerations or because of a well-orchestrated politics of exclusion and encroachments on minority property. Mokamala also strives to draw attention through Shimanta Rekha to the continuing plight of the more vulnerable groups of refugees in India for decades. He endeavors too to depict in it their yearnings for the homeland they had left behind and the dismal conditions they've had to negotiate after being uprooted from East Pakistan. Mokamala, in other words, wants his Muslim Bangladeshi viewers to sensitize themselves through the film to memories that they might ignore or prefer not to surface in the consciousness again because they had traumatized them so much. He, however, is bent on going against the silencing of memory or the desensitization of the conscience of the majority simply because they are complacent about being majoritarian. And I now come to my conclusion. Tanvir Mukamal ends Shimantarekha with a shot of Felani, a Bangladeshi Muslim girl shot by an Indian border guard while trying to cross a barbed wire boundary where she got stuck for a while even after their death, revealing how humans can be literally impaled in borders, in this case in a barbed wire fence. As I end the paper, I am reminded that the image of the barbed fence border has been used for this Bengal partition repository conference organized by Netaji Shubhash Bosch Open University. It is a vivid image of what partition has made inevitable in our time. I began my presentation anecdotally, anecdotally and let me end it that way too. When I was a child, my father would take us to our grandfather's home or Nana Bari every now and then in his car. As we crossed Kumila and at a stretch of the road where at one point the Indian Pakistan and later the India Bangladesh border was only a kilometer or two away, he stopped the car and said excitedly, Look, there's the border. We children would look at the amazement, we would look at the amazement of the landscape. For all we could see were rice fields and clumps of trees. Where was the border then? Now when we cross the stretch, there are barbed wire fences and sentry outposts for kilometers and kilometers, and we know there is a border, all too visible there. Such borders with barbed wires have perhaps become inevitable, and perhaps this is the way it is bound to be in our time. But I think also of my first experience of the openness of European Union, of the European Union some years ago, when with a Schengen visa, I crossed in a bus from London to Brussels overnight and I was sleeping in the bus after having had my visa endorsed in France. So I did not know when we had moved from France to Belgium. A few days later, I took a flight from Brussels to Rome for a holiday. Once in the department, in the departure part of an airport outside Rome, I went out and as I always have to do, and as a Bangladeshi, you really have to do this, look for the immigration counter before collecting my luggage and exiting the airport by the customs counter. But of course there was no immigration or customs counter to report to. Since I was in the European Union, and this was an airport set aside only for internal and European Union country flights. Will this happen in our part of the world sometime soon as well? All we can do is hope for such a possibility, I guess. Thank you. <laughs>